Well, welcome back to another episode of the Four Eight Men, where we are going to be diving into Romans three today. We have uh, we've added two more people since last week, and we have Parker with us as usual. Luke Jacob is back with us. Say hey, Jacob. Hello. And we got Reeves that happened to mow, uh, happened to rain today, so he was not able to mow. And as I was walking in, we saw one of our pastors, Jeffrey, and I just was like, "Hey, you want to come join the podcast?" And he said, "Yeah." So we actually have uh, some person with some theological. Uh, knowledge joining us with the podcast today, which helps me feel better because Romans is is pretty deep. So, gentlemen, thank you for joining me today on the podcast. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, so I've kind of reiterated it before, and um, just kind of be even transparent before we start. You know, obviously, Romans is a uh, super deep book. Um, a lot deeper than James, maybe from a theological standpoint. And there's definitely plenty of things that we do not know. So this is not going to be, you know, a verse by verse study, but um, it's going to be something that we just talk through things that stick out to us and um, maybe just some insight that we have on it. So we are probably not going to get through everything uh, throughout the book. One, because we don't have time. And two, because uh, we did not go to seminary. Well, Jeffrey did, but uh, most of us did not, and we, uh, yeah, don't want to speak on things that maybe we don't, uh, you know, have the best knowledge on, and maybe confuse people. So we're going to speak to some of the things that uh, impact us, and I think that maybe we know to be true. So I appreciate you for joining along for the ride, and hopefully uh, you're able to glean something from this episode today, and uh, just be challenged in your faith and uh, be encouraged in your relationship with God. So we're going to start right off. Something that stuck out to me early in Romans three was, was verse three. And Paul says, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it were written. And he goes on to talk about being justified in your words. Um, and I was reading that and I had this thought of like, man, you know, it's crazy. First century people are like dealing with church hurt kind of things like, like, like we deal with today. You know, if you see people, I've seen pastors fall in a way that impacts, you know, people around me that, that look up to them. It's almost like in the way that, you know, maybe their failures impact your relationship with God. I'm not going to, you know, name specific people who, who that that's happened to, but um, I just think that verse is interesting because Paul is saying, you know, people's unfaithfulness does not nullify the faithfulness of God. So I thought that was interesting that Paul starts it out by saying that and, you know, still seeing that you know, in our day to day of, yeah, people, you know, pe- 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 people question God's faithfulness because of unfaithful people, whether it's in the church or whether it's um, in anything, because, you know, most, we always say, you know, it's not the church that hurt you, or it, it was it was not Jesus that hurt you. It might've been the church. And by, you know, in doing that, that does not nullify God's faithfulness. So I thought, I just thought that was interesting that Paul's addressing that you know, 2000 years ago, we're still talking about some of those same issues today. No, that's good. Yeah, that's good. I think that's one thing we see a lot of today is, or even like in our lives, like we depend on our parents' faith. Uh, We depend on a sister or a brother or a pastor. And we kind of hang on to that shirt tail. I feel like most of our life until, and, and I was, we were talking about this yesterday and so I asked my question, I was like, we read here and believe to be true, this was happening back then, it still happens obviously today, and so what does that tell us, how do we perfect our faith, and then we can go to Hebrews chapter 12, and this is such a, I'm going to read this because it's very powerful, it says, Hebrews 12, therefore since you surround yourself with a cloud of witnesses, so therefore that would be meant believers in Jesus, people that are loving God and loving other people. It says, lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. So that goes goes ahead and takes out mom, dad, pastor, pastors that fail us, parents that fail us, friends that fail us. It says, look, <clears throat> look to Jesus, that's the big part, who for the joy that was set before you endured the cross, endured death, conquered death despised the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of god and man that answered my question of like how do we perfect our faith because then we go to romans three twenty three and it says we have all sinned and fallen short of god's glory and then we we get into we'll talk about the law and how 
obviously God, Jesus came to not to abolish the law, but fulfill it. And so there's that beautiful picture, Christian. I think we as young men, like for our kids, because I think we can, as moms and dads, like we can set that standard that our kids are, they can look to us to see that we're living out our faith. And, but also Jeffrey made a point last night. It's more than just living it out. We have to share that, what, what that is. And it's sharing Jesus. And then, I don't know, I thought Hebrews, man, what a beautiful picture to how we perfect that. And it's one answer is through Jesus and then who we surround ourselves with. So yeah. that was kind of my point. I, I thought that was really spoke to my heart. Yeah, I think we got to be honest with the spiritual battles that we face and mm-hmm. the journeys we're on. You know, we love to act like we've got it all together. And that's what we see in churches a lot. I love what you shared, Christians. How often do you see a pastor fail? Where does the church body go? they're out they're gone you know they give up well if he didn't have his stuff together but yet when we look at the whole of the bible i mean the bible didn't pull any punches on these people that we call heroes of the faith and they were trying to look like they had it together (laughs) they didn't i mean every one of them had massive failures and it just points to the fact that it's all about christ and we're going to struggle and i think like you said with our kids or our family we just have to be honest that we're all on a journey and we're struggling we can't we can look to one another's examples but yeah. we can't look to one another as our saviors. Yeah. You know, yeah. just recognize and I tell people all the time, I tell my kids, I will fail you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will struggle. My righteousness mm-hmm. is not my own. We've got to look to Christ. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's a it's a very real battle. And as soon as we build ourselves up on these platforms, man, yeah, we're gonna let people down and we're gonna do damage to people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh Jeffrey, I was thinking too, like with the mom and dad's like and even pastors, because you hear that all the time and everybody's response is like, man, like they're a pastor, they're a youth minister. How did they fall into this temptation or how do they fall? Well, Jesus is, <laughs> tells his disciples in Matthew 10, 16, it says, I'm sending you out as sheep among the midst of wolves. And so like Jesus tells us, man, we're, we're in a war that we're going into battle as like there is Satan is like a thief in the night. He's come to steal, kill and destroy. Right. And so I think if, like his mom and dad's like, cause I never knew what my parents struggle with as a kid or like you, if we were like open and honest of like, man, look, my, like dad struggles with, if you have a son, like being open with him, like, yeah. Hey, I struggle with pornography or if I struggle with lust, or if you're a mom and you're like, Hey, I struggle with and a daughter, I struggle with insecurities, whatever it may be that as kids, I think we're kind of, we don't know the true, true mom and dad. And if we knew that, it would allow us to be more open uh, to share things with people. And so, I don't know, that was another thought that I think we're quick as the body of church to to jump on a pastor for failing. And mm-hmm. we forget that, man, he was made in the image of God just like we were. He's just put on a, he is like, he is the sheep among wolves every single day fighting that battle. And I think that's why it's very clear that we should pay, pray diligently for our pastors and for our youth ministers, mm-hmm. college pastors, like, at worship leaders because they are in a battle that our everyday people may not be involved with because Satan is coming at them in all different ways. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. I thought that was interesting. Cause, yeah, I just read that yesterday and I was like, I've never thought about that. But yeah, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. That is just like, that's crazy that Paul is addressing that, you know, 2000 years ago and we were still wrestling with that today. And people, you know, it really does impact them when, people that they look up to in the faith stumble or fall like that impacts their relationship with God because what, whether they've spoken a, a message that, that's really impacted them, then you start to question the legitimacy of it behind it. And um, so, you know, obviously I think sometimes we can put too much emphasis on people that we look up to and maybe, you know, sometimes less on God and in a way. So uh, I thought that, that, that was cool that Paul talks about it, but what were you going to say? No, I was just saying that's good. I had a conversation with a buddy about like, a lot of people these days, like, they'll skew their whole thing. Like, people will be thrown into confusion because, like, that's what they do. They put their weight into someone that either brought them to faith or, you know, really impacts their life. And then that's who they kind of, you know, have a misconception of, like, getting all their knowledge from instead of, like, searching in the Bible yourself. I feel like we could all do that, you know. Someone you really look up to and they fall. And then you're like, wow, is, is God really who he says he is, like, through that person? But then it's, like, also a heart check on yourself. It's like, one – do we judge people? Cause like, we're not God, you know? And then who, who is God? Is God who he says he is in the Bible or who a guy that was on a pedestal, you know, 
representing God and because he misrepresented in one moment, does that change who God is? Like it's saying in that verse, I love that you shared that. I didn't read when I first read that and before you said that, I didn't see that, but that, that was good. I liked that. I enjoyed that point of view. That's awesome. I, I really like what y'all said. I, I think for me, I thought it, about it more too, is like just part, not only as like how we see other people, but how we relate to God in that sense. I think a lot of times, as Paul goes on to say, as he's talking to the Jews, who we all know, that was very a works-based thing before this time, right? They had all these laws they had to follow. It was super religious. I think for me, I grew up in a very religious environment where I felt like it was a lot of, it's all about what you do. You've got to kind of be good enough. And so I think for me, and it's so comforting because it's like, man, even even when I mess up, even when I'm not faithful, it does not affect God's faithfulness. But I think That's we good. we still get caught up on that sometimes. Like when we when we're slipping, when we're when we've fallen into sin, we do we really believe God remains the same faithfulness to mm-hmm. us, or do we believe He changes His disposition towards us? Or oh, because we messed up so many times, He's not going to extend the same grace that He did beforehand. So. And that's always so comforting to me. Like, man, even when I come short, as I do daily, it doesn't change mm-hmm. his faithfulness to me. Yeah, that's a good part. That's good. That's easy to get caught in that headspace. Like, oh, I'm yeah. doing this. God allowed this to happen, or this is why this happens because yeah. I'm not walking like this way. Mm-hmm. What are y'all's? What are y'all's thoughts on verse eight? He says, "And why not do evil that good may come." Uh, some people slanderously charge us with saying their condem- their condemnation is just. But I thought that that line was interesting. And why not do evil that good may come? You know, sometimes we see that of, you know, I don't really know of a good example, but you know, some. I mean, obviously, you know, you have the verse where you know, God think God work all things for those who love Him. But I'm gonna botch it. But um, Joseph, when he's in the pit. Or is in the I guess the palace at this point. He said, "What the enemy meant for evil, God intended for good." Um, but I was just curious what y'all thought on the on that verse, and why not do evil that good may come? Well, I think it's definitely interesting because, <clears throat> I mean, in history past and today, like we see really bad people. Like there's good things going for them in their life, and so um, that's like the first thing that I think of. Yeah, and so I feel like what that verse is saying, like, if you look at that, it might make someone, especially younger in their faith, just be like, well, what does it matter? Like the Lord can turn anything for good. So if it's glorifying him, I mean, it's, it's pretty, it gets pretty deep. Like, yeah, and it's hard for me to even start to go and talk about it. Um, just cause like he turns just like you're, you're quoting, God turns all things for good. Um, and like, even, bad people in high positions we're seeing them like people are so successful and it looks like everything's going for them um but we know without jesus and this whole passage is pointing us back to that it's like you can't live the life god intended for you to live yeah yeah i think it's the whole idea of just cheap grace Mm -hmm. and people are struggling so badly with the idea of what God revealed to Paul about grace and what God reveals to Paul is what you can't run far enough away from God. Like I tell people all the time, you can run a thousand miles away from God and turn around and he's one step away. Yeah. And so then Paul is like, I don't care how bad you've been. God, God's grace can cover all that. When they're like, Oh, basically what you're saying, then be as bad as you want. Yeah. Mm-hmm. God will just give you more grace, and it's just cheap grace. You know, that's yeah. a fake kind of grace that says, "Oh, so you're saying." And people act like that in the church. I can do whatever live I want, like hell, mm-hmm. every day, and then go. And God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And boom, it all goes away. Right. And Paul's like, no, "That's not." And that's kind of what they were accusing us. You're saying, "Well, mm-hmm. if the more unrighteous you are, the more righteous God is." Well, heck. <laughs> Yeah. Go be more unrighteous. Yeah. And you're going to get to see more of God's righteousness. And it's like, man, that is fake. I know y'all covered James. James laid that out. And he's like, man, that is fake. That is mm-hmm. death. Faith without works is death. And so I think he's he's saying is like, we can't cheapen yeah. the grace of God that he calls us to something greater. And I think sometimes we kind of act like that. And it's probably natural. But when we hear testimonies, what testimony we do we want to hear? We want to hear the worst, most awful 
terrible life and we're like, yeah, God, you really got that one. But God's yeah. after all people, not right. just the most, what we would deem as the most unrighteous. Right. Yeah. Taking care of your health is not always easy, but it should at least be simple. And that's why for the last three years, I've been drinking AG1 every day. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day. And it makes me feel more energized and more focused as I take on the day. AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement. So each serving delivers everything my body needs, like my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. So I decided to try AG1 because I just didn't feel healthy. I wanted something in the mornings that I could drink that tasted delicious, that gave me more energy and uh, helped with my focus but before I work out. That's really when I love to drink it. Um, and I just, I did not want to drink coffee in the morning because I have a lot of caffeine and I wanted something that I thought tasted delicious and um, that was going to give me energy to, for, for my workout. And uh, AG1 helps me feel more focused and I even feel like it helps me with my recovery um, that I've seen for after my workouts. And I recommend AG1 to almost everyone I meet. Uh, my parents love it. My friends love it. Um, my wife, Sadie, loves to drink it. And uh, my dad is like the biggest AG1 fan. So if you don't believe me, you can take it from him. Don't know how you would take it from him uh, because he's not on social media, but he loves it. With AG1, I know that I'm getting a quality product. AG1's ingredients are sourced for nutrient density, absorption, and potency. And every batch goes through rigorous testing and is backed by multiple research studies. In a research study, AG1 was shown to double the amount of healthy bacteria in your gut as well. And I love that every scoop includes prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes for gut support. I drink my AG1 first thing in the morning, so I'm getting optimal nutrient absorption. I just fill up my bottle with cold water, add a scoop of AG1, and shake it up. It's that easy. Or when I'm in a rush, I just grab a travel pack and mix it up on the go. And the best part of all, I don't have to worry about mixing and matching pills and powders because AG1 is an all-in-one solution that supports my mental and physical health without all the hassle. In just 60 seconds, I'm giving my body everything it needs and setting up a sustainable, healthy habit. If there's one product I trust to support my whole body health, it's AG1. And that's why we have been partnered with them for so long. It's easy and satisfying to start your journey with AG1. So try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase at drinkag1.com slash huff. That's drinkag1.com slash huff. Check it out. I think Paul got, Paul talks about this in Romans six, and but as you, we you, you get into Romans six now. Nah. Well, no, no well, it's that's just, like three episodes I, away. That we continue well, sitting. No, as Paul Paul throughout his all of his letters, he says by no means several multiple times, mm -hmm. and that that answers. He says by no. He, he says, "What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound?" And he says, "By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it?" And so it's the the mindset of. Whenever we're buried in Christ, there's got to be something new come of that new life. Just as Jesus was buried in the grave, he conquered something that's never been done before. So there was a miraculous change that changed our world because something had to die and had to conquer something that's never happened. And so I think there's a reason Paul says over and over by no means. And I think that's, I don't know how many times he's mentioned it, but it was a lot throughout his letters. So. Jeffrey, what are your thoughts on, because we've, we've also looked at First John, and, you know, John talks about, you know, making a practice of sinning. Obviously, Romans 6, Paul talks about those who live in sin. What, what do you think that distinction is for whether it's practicing sin, living in sin versus, you know, struggling with sin, stumbling in sin? What do you think that distinction is of, like, the practicing versus, like, stumbling? Yeah, that's a really tough one. I mean, for me, it's, it's all about identity. You know, do I say, well, oh, I'm a sinner. You know, a lot of times I say, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I'm like, no, I'm the righteousness of Christ. Like, you know, and I think it's how we recognize. I think whenever we, um, whenever we throw in the towel, for me, uh, living a life of sin or practicing sin means I've thrown in the towel. Like, I'm not even on this journey to Christ. It's just yeah. like, that's what I do. Oh, you know me, that's my struggle. I just struggle with that. That's my deal is like, we've accepted that this is now part of my identity. And that, it, you know, how can... How can a man serve two masters? Mm -hmm. You love one and hate the other. You hate the first. And so I think that's why Jesus said, man, there's a very narrow road that will lead you to life. And so few people find that because you can't leave yourself enchained by the things of this world. But, yeah. but Paul made it really beautifully clear in Galatians when he said, man, we've got this nasty flesh nature and these echoes from death. It's always clawing at us, but we've got to be on this journey of, of, following Christ. And so for me, that's what it is, is like, are you even in the battle 
are you not in the battle? Yeah. And so many of us that our flesh natures, we battled so hard, we've just resolved ourselves to, that's just the thing I do. I'm a guy that struggles with pornography. That's just it. That's part of my life. Or I'm a, you know, this or that, or this, adi- whatever it is, you know, I mean, we can paint a whole myriad of sins, but that's me. That's just part of my character, you know, and as you know me, I'm always da da da. And it's like, man, and that's where the Bible says, don't live in it. Yeah. Don't practice it. Like you're going to stumble, man, but you have got to daily commit yourself to be the righteousness of Christ, to be identified in his and who he is, to be a new creation. And the moment you go, nah, I'm mostly going to identify myself with the things of this world. That's where John said in first John, you are a liar. The truth is not in you. Whew, that's scary. Yeah. And so I think every day we get up and we fight a battle and God is greater than anything that we face. And no yeah. matter how hard of a grip, some sin, some weakness, some attitude, just something of this world, the acts of the simple nature has got a hold of you. Yes, God can overcome that too. Yeah. Don't ever say, oh, that's just going to be mm-hmm. with me until I die. He can take mm-hmm. that from you in a moment. Yeah. Would you? Good. Good. I had a question. Would, I don't know. This might throw us off topic, but would you say like being in a state like that would be like almost a lack of? I w- I don't know if this would be the answer. Like lack of like spiritual maturity, or would you say it's like lack of like just being like in the word or like honed in? I feel like it'd be like a lack of conviction, obviously, but you would have to be in a certain state to have that lack of conviction. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, the gospel transforms. That's right. what it does. That's right. the goal of the gospel. And it's almost like what Paul said, why the heck are y'all still drinking milk? You ought to be eating food right now. Yeah. So, yeah, I think whenever we live by this, it's, I think for, you know, in this world's tough. Yeah. Man, following Christ, it ain't easy. You know, yeah, we can sure. beat up people that are living in sin. Which one of us doesn't sin? Yeah. You know, and sure. so I think, I think it's difficult and it's challenging. But yeah, of course, it's a lack of, maturity and the fact that we haven't allowed we haven't allowed the light of christ to enter that part of our heart and say hey i need you to transform that that's good i I personally and i'll share this i think that maybe y'all can relate maybe not but i find myself in seasons where i lose sight of having jesus just lead every part of my life and more recently i've just found myself in this place where i just really just gotten off i just wasn't like i was just struggling and in the midst of craziness and life's busyness i just like i wasn't seeking him the way that i should have been and i'm really coming out of that right now and thankful for things like this bible study and just forcing me to get in the word and like this passage was especially good for me in that sense because it's just bringing me back to remember that like temptations are going to rise and I'm going to get into this place where, and I would call it spiritual immaturity on, and in my season where I kind of been going through that, like it is spiritual immaturity because I know I have been changed by the gospel, but I am just as susceptible in my first year of walking with Christ as I am now to not be doing the work like every day, like waking up and saying, I'm going to, like I'm going to slay sin by the throat today. I'm not going to give in to these temptations. And so if I'm not seeking Jesus, like I found myself way more susceptible to temptation, whether it's with my devices or the TV and whatever. And, and in my reaction, like the past couple of weeks, I've literally, me and my wife have just cut out TV. Cause I'm like, I'm not seeking Jesus and I'm not leading us the way that I need to be. And especially as a worship leader, I just, I just feel the devil coming after me in that and, and allowing myself to just slip up and I don't know, just start to share that because I just, that's more recently where I relate to that oh, and just kind of coming back to, okay, none of this stuff that concerns me on a day-to-day basis, if it's pulling my attention away from Jesus, it does not matter that much. Right. If I get to that place, I have to keep myself in check. That's good. That's good. I think too, it's like, I mean, I think it's it's the same with everything in our life. Like we have to try to be disciplined with our, you know, with our spiritual stuff. Like I feel like sometimes, I don't know why I feel like that idea of spiritual disciplines kind of like gets a bad rap, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, yeah. cause it can seem like workspace or can seem maybe pharisaical to like, you know, be disciplined, but it's like, no, like 
yes, I think obviously spiritual maturity and then you have, you know, sanctification over time. But at the same time, like a lot of those fruit come from you being disciplined, like yeah. whether it's, you know, you actively, you know, not having Instagram on your phone, like that's you being disciplined at something, you know, you waking up in the morning and studying the Bible before you go to work, like that's you being disciplined. And I think sometimes, I think sometimes we can just kind of, yeah, maybe associate being disciplined with like being super religious and, and it's like, but it doesn't have to be, you know? So I think I, I, I just had that thought when you were talking, so I'm like, sometimes I feel like we just can think about spiritual disciplines or just being disciplined with our faith and it, it kind of have a negative connotation to it. No, I think that's good. Obviously we can all say like, if we don't have other people's input in our life, we're not going to grow. Right. And so we're talking about like, I'm not going to grow like being like, if I'm not getting discipled by other brothers, like there's only so far I can go like on my own will. And like, you know, if I'm not saying the word, then obviously I'm not going to give myself, you know, the discipline that I need that I would seek out from somebody else or from, from God, obviously. But if I'm not doing it, like seeking out the Lord for myself, I would need someone else to step in and like, give me that helping hand too, as well. So you remember what Tom said on Sunday, he said like, if if everything is getting to you, it means you're not getting with him. It was like I can't remember, I can't remember the exact quote, but it was something like that. I thought it was really good. Yeah, I think that I can't remember the exact, but it was just that. Yeah, if everything in the world is getting to you, then it shows that you're not getting with him. Yeah, and so yeah, I just I thought that was so good. Yeah, it was powerful because it's true. So yeah, it's like if I'm you know a basket case over certain little things, I can kind of usually directly pinpoint it to <laughs> I'm not in the word or you know, worshiping when I'm in my car and to, 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 to worship music or whatever, or yeah. praying. So yeah, that, uh, that quote really kind of hit me because I was like, yep, that's usually true. <laughs> if I'm kind of quick to snap then everything's kind of getting under my skin, then I'm yeah really not spending time with him. Yeah. That's, I think when Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, I think the commitment we make to following Jesus is hard. And I think that's why it's good for us to do hard things as men, because Picking up your cross every day, I don't care if you're following Jesus for 40 years or for two days. It's a something that we diligently have to wake up and commit to is to pick up our cross and follow him. And so I think that's why, you know, we can be hard on ourselves. But that's why when I go through a CrossFit workout with somebody, that's something you hate. You hate in the moment doing it because it sucks. But when you get done, there's something about when you suffer with somebody else and you finish something, you're like, man, like I want to do it again. And so I think that's when we surround ourselves with a cloud of witnesses that are sh struggling, doing hard things, <clears throat> to become disciplined of following Jesus, there's an encouragement there because when one brother can't pick his cross up, the other one can tote it with him. And so I think that's a <clears throat> that's a big deal for me is it doesn't matter if I've been following Jesus for 10 years, I still on the next day, I got to pick up my cross and follow Jesus. And so I think that's where we can get lost and like, man, I've done this for 10 years it's just a breeze through here and and that's i think it gets harder because then we start if we're truly asking for god's wisdom we start dying to self more and we start doing things that we wouldn't do when we were a baby christian or whatever it may be and so i don't know that was something that really hit my heart it's like man if uh if i'm not doing hard things and we can talk about you know working out but also if i'm not if we're not leaning into romans and doing something that's hard then maybe we're like, because when Christian and I talked about this, it's two sides of this. We can we can punt and do something easier, and you know maybe easier for us to that we wouldn't have to prep through when we walk through this door. We could just you know, but if we lean into the the power of the Spirit, man, this could be. I told Christian one of the best Bible studies we've ever done because it requires us to to work at this and to be disciplined in our study because mm -hmm. you can't just show up and expect Romans to just especially the front half to just like oh we're gonna we'll we'll hit it on the fly so I don't know that's been an encouragement for me. I want to talk to you guys about something that's close to my heart and crucial for our generation, which is online integrity. And that's why I'm excited to share about Covenant Eyes. And Covenant Eyes is more than just an internet filter. It's so much more than that, and it's so much more powerful. It's actually a tool that helps you stay accountable and pure while you're online. It's a powerful software that monitors your internet activity and sends a report to a trusted friend or family member. And this also creates a support system that encourages healthy online habits. I know that sometimes uh, your internet activity, it can just be you looking at it. And when you know that you have an accountability partner and that 
you have something that can send a report to a trusted friend or family. It, um, yeah, it's just, it's just extra security and it helps you uh, just be careful with what you're searching online. Covenant Lives is not about restricting you, but it's about empowering you to live with integrity. I think sometimes we can um, you know, think about pornography or think about uh, blockers or something like that and think that it's restricting us, but it's, it might be restricting you, but it's restricting you to live in more freedom. It's not restricting you from having fun or whatever. Uh, but it's empowering you to live this life with integrity, like I said. And it's so easy to install. It works on all of your devices, and it truly makes a difference. You know, you can take my word for it. I wrestled with pornography for years throughout um, late middle school, early high school, and even kind of early on into college. I really wrestled with, um, you know, with this. I, uh, it would be easy for me to, to see something and then, you know, want to search something. And it wasn't until that I really, for me, got surrounded by a bunch of guys in college that all kind of wrestled with it. And um, kind of, we all wrestled with it and we all started confessing it and, and finding freedom in it that I really got freed from it. You know, hindsight now, looking back, I just wish I would have um, taken it more seriously early on in my life. And I wish I would have um, found freedom in it earlier and gotten guys around me or had something like Covenant Eyes that physically wouldn't, would have let me block inappropriate websites that I um, used to search all the time. So do not just take my word for it, but you can join over 1.5 million people who have used Covenant Eyes to experience victory over porn. So if you're looking to take control of your online life and honor God with your internet use, head over to covenanteyes.com slash huff to get your first month free. That's covenanteyes.com slash huff. Stay strong and walk in integrity online with our friends at Covenant Eyes. Reef, Shank, thanks for sharing that because we've definitely all been through that for sure. Moments where it's like, you know, I don't really want to pursue this right now. Like, like Maybe like I know I should be, so... Thanks for sharing that. That's really good. I think, I mean, guys, we're so forgetful. We're so quick to forget sure. what God's done for us and where we came from and all that. Like, I forget how many times I heard a stat one time, like how many times in the Old Testament it either says, do not forget or remember, you know, God telling his people that or a prophet telling his people that from God because they were constantly forgetting who he was. I mean, was it three days into the into the desert? with the people of Egypt and they're already like, Hey, we want to go back. This is, this is terrible. They're already forgetting the slavery. They were just in just or a Moses and Aaron. He's on the mountain and right. Aaron builds the golden calf. Yeah. It's just like we're, but we're the same way. Yeah, you know, it's sure. like God comes through for us and gives us that grace. We're so quick to forget. But to you all y'all's point, it's like, man, we, we need these, this word so much in us every day. Like I need to go back here and remember, okay, no one is righteous, not even one. Like there's, I have no righteousness on my own standing. My my works don't mean anything. It is God's grace. It's his work for me that has brought me to this place. And going through all these things, it's just, it is so important. And again, I know it was personally, we're just, I'm so quick to forget these truths. So it's so good to be reminded by them. For sure. It's good. What you flipping to over there? Well, no, I just, talking about just people in the Bible, it's the same when Moses died and handed that torch off to Joshua to continue to lead the people into the promised land. At the end of that, Louis talks about this with his church, but there's a time to rest and there's a time to get with it. And so like his church, they take one Sunday off and it's to, to rest and to really reflect back on what God has done and how faithful he has been. Because we can be so active and doing all these things and think we're, we're checking these boxes and we're doing the things for the kingdom. But then when something happens, we forget, man, God's faithfulness all the way to this point in the Joshua. Uh, it says a long time afterwards when the Lord, this is chapter 23, this is Joshua's charge as he's about to die. He says, the Lord has given rest to Israel for all their surrounding enemies. And Joshua was old and well advanced in years. Joshua summoned all Israel, the elders, the head of the church. I'm going to, and it's at verse three, it says, and all of you have seen, that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who fights for you. Behold, I have allotted you the inheritance. And so he's sending this proclamation to these people. Like, do you remember what God has done for you? Like, they have been fighting people that there's no way they could conquer. And he continues to make that point throughout the book of Joshua. Is like, remember who brought you to the, to the sea. Remember who conquered the enemies mm -hmm. that you shouldn't have conquered like mm -hmm. and these people were still forgetting that and they were living in it every single day yeah and so i think that's a huge thing for us as fathers of jesus is like you said parker's there's a time that sometimes we just need to 
rest and reflect on God's faithfulness because we can get lost in the fact of like, man, when, when, when we think he's unfaithful, we forget about all the faithfulness because mm-hmm. that, the point of earlier is God doesn't need our faithfulness. He wants our faithfulness because yeah. his faithfulness never fails. He's the only perfecter, the only perfect faith that will ever walk this earth. And so, uh, I don't know, that story really resonated with me because that's our life is following Jesus. We're going to continue to be in a fight until mm-hmm. the end. And it's like, who is sending that proclamation to this world of saying, hey, as, a, as somebody's about to pass away or die, a leader of the faith is like, who else is fitting to send that charge to the yeah. other group of people? So, I don't know, that was, that kind of hit me between the teeth. Parker, I love how you brought up the, um, the none is righteous, no, not one. And um, yeah, I, I don't know if, if uh, Paul's quoting Isaiah and Psalms in that, or if it's just um, Psalms, but 11 through, or 10, 10 through 18, he talks about all these things. He says, you know, their throat is an open grave. Uh, their mouth is full of curses. Their feet are swift. Just had a voice crack, but it's fine. Uh, but verse 18, he ends it with, there is no fear of God before their eyes. And I was just thinking about that of, you know, 10 through 17 happen because, there's, that, because they don't fear God. And I just thought that was, I just thought it was cool how um, just kind of that ends that little tagline there. And it's because, you know, your throat will be an open grave. You will deceive people. You won't seek after God. You will, you know, turn away and, and, and worship um, worthless idols. And that happens when there's no fear of God before your eyes. And I was just having that thought of, man, what do you think, what do y'all think, you know, throughout the Bible to where we are now? just kind of how that idea of the fear of God has kind of, I don't know if, if maybe been distorted is the right word or like been lost or confused. Cause I feel like, you know, 2000 years ago, they have a different grasp or idea on what it means to fear God versus what we do. And, you know, 2000 years later. So I was curious what, what y'all thought. Um, because I don't think it had the same kind of connotation than like people now talk about, why would I want to follow a God that I have to be afraid of? I just don't know if they wrestled with that same thought back then. Maybe they did, but didn't if y'all had any thoughts on that. I just feel like I feel like fear also just <clears throat> would just start off by like what you who you believe God is. Like I mean, I feel like I could fear God the same way they did then if we're if you're saying the full Bible is true. Like if you believe that, I would say as you should if you're gonna follow the Lord, because you can't take bits and pieces, but like a God that parts the Red Sea. Y'all ever seen anybody part a sea? Like I would I would definitely like fear that in a way of like the all and powerfulness like of our mm-hmm. Lord. Like is like he can do things like that. He can cast a demon out. Like talk about casting demons into pigs and them running off and just like into the water, like things like that. Like I don't know, just like the it's like more the awe and wonder and like power of like what God can like show us through the Holy Spirit and like his spiritual power like raining down from heaven. It's kinda like that. Instead of like a God a fear that God's gonna send me to hell. Like mm-hmm. that's our choice kind of deal i feel like people like be on the fire and brimstone kind of like fear god like if you don't believe in god you're going to hell and that's what like your whole spirituality is based off of obviously i feel like i grew up in that yeah but like i just feel like it's also just the power and like what our god can do obviously the alpha and omega like he controls not us but like just the world that we're in like he created it with his hands like so it's just like the fear and all of that because we can't even comprehend that so hmm. i like where i'm at on the fear yeah, I agree. I don't think fear has to be a terror. It's a holy awe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The reason we don't fear God is because we become short-sighted and we kind of become yeah. our own gods. It sort of makes me think if you've got little kids, mine are getting older, is like when they get in their room and start playing, how many of y'all dealt with this? Your kids get out of control. And they're, they know dad's in another room this is his house and they're Mm -hmm. getting out of control they're fighting they're yelling and and it's you go in there you get them in trouble you correct them and they're like gosh we're not going to do that again and then you close the door and then what happens five minutes later it's like they've already forgotten they don't have the maturity to go oh wait a minute i'm part of this bigger thing and i'm not supposed to act like that and we can see that in children and go like What is wrong with you? I just told you. You know I'm going to come back in here. Mm -hmm. But yet that's the same way God is. is We get caught up in our little worlds and instantly we lose sight that like Mm -hmm. there's an eternity. There's an eternal Mm -hmm. God who's Mm -hmm. knocked out my life that I will stand before him 
one day before the judgment seat and we're like, yeah. yeah, but I'm mostly concerned with he may be mad and this job and that, you know, it's like, just like children, we get so short sighted that we completely lose fear of God. And when you lose fear of God, eternity means nothing. I'm just chasing my flesh mm -hmm. nature. I'm yeah. chasing my desires. I'm chasing my success. I'm chasing my pride. And we just lose sight of God. That's yeah. Good. When I was just thinking with you saying that, it was like, the importance of a father figure too. And like for your kids, like fearing you and understanding what it means to fear like that fatherly figure, how important that is. Um, and how that translates to our relationship with God. Like that's exactly how it works on a smaller level as they're growing up and developing. Like they learn to understand like, mm. well, one that if I act up, my father's going to discipline me. And then we know from scripture, like God disciplines th those he loves and mm -hmm. it's out of love. Mm to correct your behavior that he's going to yeah. discipline you. And so then that's like where that fear comes in and meets that love. It's like, I don't want to get out of line and I don't want that discipline. So I fear and it's a, it's a healthy fear. That's where fear is rightly dealt with in our hearts in a way that draws us closer to him. It's like, I want to please my father and you know, I'd, maybe I've talked about it at different times, but that with a divorced family, like that wasn't always at my house. And so I know for me, and I can't imagine how many, the numbers of people that don't have that healthy father figure in their life, that's hard to translate when you don't have that. Yeah. All the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. I think to add to that Christian, since we're, I'm going to just go, go for it. Um, uh, it kind of goes with the propitiation because uh, I was studying about this. And there's, if you look up the definition of propitiation, there's Webster says it's the act of propitiating. So it's like, okay. So you look, <laughs> if you break the word down, pro means for something, right? And so if you look at that and break that down, like Jeffrey was saying, he's going to keep, he'll keep continuing to discipline his kids, even though, and that shows like, hey, like I love you. I'm going to continue to discipline them. And so you think about propitiation for our sins. You think about what Jesus does in our life. He is for us. There's no, there's, we can't hardly grasp the love that Jesus has for us because yeah. guess what he continues to do? He continues to love us even when we fail. He continues to discipline us even though uh, we don't want to be disciplined sometimes. And so there's this, that word propitiation, I think of like it's untranslatable. And also the love of Jesus is uncomprehendable to understand yeah. that. And so when I broke that word down, I was like, okay, we can't define propitiation. There's no definition for it, but we can if we read God's word. Yeah, He is the propitiation. He is the unfathomable sacrifice that he's going to continue to love us. That's something that how do we as Christians, like I struggled to think like, how can I love these people that are killing Christians daily? How can I? love a child molester like how can i like how can i love the people that are hard to love and like jesus jesus does and so uh to kind of y'all's points that that word really kind of ties into what jeffrey was saying as a father as we as fathers like you're going to love your kids no matter what they do what they say or where they turn to if they're following jesus or not you're going to always love them and we see that with the prodigal son like that whole picture so uh Anyways, I didn't know if we wanted to doubt. Yeah, that's good. Propitiation, well, yeah, but we're about to get there. But yeah, I mean, even just from a practical standpoint, I think about it. You know, kind of like we talked about it, Jeffrey, just from the fear side of you know, with with my two kids. Obviously, my mine are still younger, but you know, the idea of fearing me in the sense of not because you know, if, just for instance, if if they grow up and it's like I don't want to, I, I fear my father from the standpoint of you know, not because he's going to ground me if I if I do this, but more so because I don't want to break his heart you know i don't want to upset him so it's, it's kind of it's yeah it's it's a healthy fear it's it's a reverence and an awe it's not every day i'm just terrified of you know god's gonna rebuke me and strike me down it's more so mm -hmm. yeah i fear god from the standpoint of like i don't want to break his heart because of what he's done for me so i think about that with with, with my kids of yeah, i don't want them to fear me from the standpoint of dad's gonna spank me or you know do something harsh to me but but more so uh, I just don't want to upset him because I love him and I don't want to break his heart. So I feel like a good word is like respect. Kind of. Yeah. Like if you know who God is, it's like a, a respect. 
kind of deal. Yeah. Well, we're about to get into the uh, one of my favorite uh, verses, which is 23. But real quick, I kind of want to hit on, and maybe Jeffrey, you can kind of speak to this just because I don't know if, 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 well, if whoever wants to speak to it, but that going from 20 to 21, you know, just the idea of going from uh, judgment to justification and this is for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So that idea of knowledge of sin, you know, it's the idea of, you know, it can't, the law can't save you, mm -hmm. um, but it is useful in giving us, you know, this idea of, of, of what sin is. But going from 20 to 21, it says, uh, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So I just love that verse, how from 20 to 21, and Paul adds the but now, and kind of separating, you know, the old covenant, new covenant, um, in a way. So I don't know if somebody wanted to kind of hit on that for a quick second before we get into 23. Well, to start off, yeah, before, tw I mean, before 21, he's really presenting the problem, which is a lot of the Jewish people are like, we have the law. We are people of the law, so we're good. And you'll talk about it later in Romans. He's like, hey, buddy, it don't work that way. Right. Let's think about laws today. Like no righteousness can take away from having broken the law. You know, it's not like if I broke the law last week, I don't know, I robbed a store. I was speeding. Uh -huh. Okay. You broke the law. Dude, don't worry. I'm going to do really good stuff this week. And yeah. that will have taken that away. Mm -hmm. He's like, the law doesn't work that way. So the law, just like our laws today, they can't make you good. They just point out when you're not good. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And That's you've good. all failed. Only perfect people go to heaven. Are you perfect? No. Have you ever mm. broken the law? Yes. Well, guess what? You got a big problem. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because if you haven't broken the law, that means you're not righteous. Okay. Do you know that God is righteous? Yes. But you're not. Mm -hmm. There's a void. And he's that's what he's trying to say. They're like, we're yeah. people of the law. You are, and you broke mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And God is righteous. And that's when he starts laying out this idea. That's what faith is is all about it's about faith man you've got to have faith in him and in his righteousness and so he's building into this argument to let them know it don't matter if you're jew gentile Greek, it don't matter who you are it's faith is faith that saved us not who you're born not your ethnicity not because you're of the law the law did not save you it pointed out your brokenness and we we know that and, and i think that's a good thing about understanding god's laws is like we said not to walk around in guilt or shame or be ashamed but go Oh God, I need you. I can't yeah. save myself. So many people I've led to Christ. That's why I ask all the time. Have you lived a perfect life? No. Okay. Well, there's bad news. Heaven's perfect. So now you've got to figure out how to make yourself perfect. What What does that mean? Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and I mean, that's mm -hmm. what Paul is laying out here. It's like, man, we, yeah. none of us, have, we can't justify ourselves. We can't make ourselves perfect. We can't wipe away sin well how do you do it what's that word we don't know how to translate propitiation he mm -hmm. did that right he wiped it away he paid it he covered it he satisfied the wrath of god it's through him and so he's just hammering pointing everything to christ mm -hmm. i think it's a this word manifested apart from the law and i was thinking about you go to john chapter 1 verse 14 it says and the word of god became flesh and dwelt among us but we have seen his glory glory is the only son the father full of grace and truth and that word manifest, like manifest, manifestation, is like when something comes alive or something that you can either tangibly see or like you see change or have an effect on something else. And I think that's when we read, um, goodness, I'm going blank, Romans, oh, goodness, or Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, mm -hmm. it's sharper than any two edged sword. So when the word of God comes alive, it is manifested into some type of experience you've seen or something that's mm -hmm. changed somebody's so i think that's when we see that as a follower of jesus it says has been manif manifested apart from the law for the law and the prophets bear witness to it the righteousness of god through faith which is in jesus christ for all who believe and so with a just god we are justified because of his son on our behalf and so it's this confusing concept that we it's hard to grasp but if we if God looks at us and sees that his son is justifiable, then guess what? That makes us righteous because we have Jesus in our heart. And so it's that, I think what we've talked about too, the having that repentance and confession, like, you know, every time we repent and we confess, man, like Jesus forgives that and he forgets that and he sees his son covering that. And I think 
we'll get into this later talking about uh or maybe we will if y'all want to but the mercy seat and how that goes into because there's some stuff that i've never been brought to light but that was my went back to john that was good for me to read so that's good you ever thought that was a great point that idea of i broke the law last week so what am i going to try to do this week to mm-hmm. kind of make up for that it's like there's, like there's nothing you can do like you broke the law you know i've never thought about it from like a just a practicality standpoint like that that's really good oh, that's good i think some i thought about too back to the propitiation point is is like I've heard it talked about like in a legal standpoint, right? Like think about a judge sitting before you yeah. like said to your point, you've broken the law and there has to be, like, there's consequences for that, right? There's a penalty for that. So that's the same for us, right? We've sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. So that means eternal separation from God. There has to be that payment for that sin. Mm-hmm. And like as he kind of refers to the law, there used to be the payments, used to be the sacrifices to temporarily cover you. But it's not like, you know, you go to court, like to your point, you get a speeding ticket and the judge just decides, okay, I'm going to overlook that and just not give you a penalty. You know, like that sin had to be paid for. It wasn't just God decided, okay, I'm going to forget about that. I mean, he ultimately does in a way, but he's like, no, I'm going to, that that sin still has to be paid for. And mm-hmm. that's what he does in Christ. And I just think about it that way. It's not just like, I was like, okay, I'm just going to kind of slide that over. Mm-hmm. And he's like, no, the only way, for us to be made right with him as if that payment, that penalty was paid for in full. Yeah. And that's the point Paul's trying to make is we could never do that through the law, that we could never pay that penalty or make that wrong right. And that that's Christ good. was the only way. That's good. I just had this thought and maybe hold on, try to try to stay with me here. This 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 might make like no sense. Because like let's say you do break the law, right? And then you I'm I'm thinking about people who, you know, who break the law, who, who, who do go to jail, but then they do like community service kind of stuff. And they're like working back towards things. So even just from the standpoint of like, when you break the law, like there's still consequences for your sin, right? Mm-hmm. Like even, you know, being a new creation in Jesus, like there's still things that I've done that I'm still working through maybe mentally, like not from like a salvation standpoint, but just from like a mm-hmm. conscious, like, like there's still gonna be consequences for like decisions you make. Like yes, mm-hmm. it, yes, it doesn't mean that, you know, like there's justification for your relationship with God, but like there's still things you're gonna have to work out that, you know, like whatever whatever you did, like there's still consequences for your sin. So even just think about it from that yeah. standpoint, I was like, yeah, when you do break the law, like there are things that you do, like you know, picking up trash on the side of the street, or like you know, there's certain things that like mm-hmm. you do in your society to kind of mend mend for, for those mistakes and. Yeah, just thinking about that of, you know, sins in the past of like, you know, there's still things that we're all kind of working through, you know, from, from things we've done. Uh, and not that it, you know, nullifies you from from forgiveness and salvation, but it's, you know, like if, if you know, if, if, if you choose to, to disobey God in certain things, like, like there are consequences mm-hmm. um, now and then even down the road that, that, that you're going to have to walk through. So I thought that was a good point. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good. I thought I thought this was interesting. I read this commentary. It says justification solves the problem of man's guilt before a righteous judge. Redemption solves the problem of man's slavery to sin, the world, and the devil. And then propitiation solves the problem of offending our creator. Mm-hmm. Don't really know what all that means, but I thought it was really good. And just kind of breaking yeah. down the, you know, the justification, redemption, and propitiation. And um, yeah, thinking about it from a court standpoint and kind of, you know, what it, um, you know, what it means and how, you know, obviously God is the judge and, um, you know, we can't come before him with any of our merits or anything that we've done. And it's only through, it's only through Jesus. Yeah. I thought about, you know, the, the story of Jesus and Barabbas, right? When Jesus is about to get crucified and you've got, the murderer, I believe, someone, I remember he had said he led a revolution of, of really bad people, right? It's kind of like, okay, one of these people is getting crucified. Which one is it, you know? And you have someone who, by the law, deserves to be in someone who doesn't. It's exactly the same with us, right? Like, we're like Barabbas. We're the one who actually deserves that penalty, but Jesus doesn't at all. But he's the one who steps in. And he like said, like to my point earlier, it's like that payment had to be paid. It wasn't like it just got 
taken away. You know, it's like yeah, those consequences led to to that, and so yeah. this is yeah. just a crazy example. Like when you look at that, like Jesus, the perfect Son of God, and He's the one who got the penalty of that our murderer deserved, and that's mm-hmm. the same. And for us, First Corinthians six, you were bought with a price, yeah, and yeah, that that was the price, mm. Jesus on the cross, yeah. So that I feel like that even sometimes, yeah, you know, helps me with things I wrestle with of, you know, whether it's your identity or your value or whatever, and yeah, just thinking about what Jesus did for you. I mean, you know, it's the whole cliche, Jesus was thinking of you when he died on the cross, and kind of believing that and, and and kind of living it out helps me at times where I kind of get in my head of like, you know, am I enough? Am I worth it? And those kind of things. And yeah. thinking about that, you know, the idea of you were bought with a price. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty humbling to think about kind of going off of Romans three twenty three. I read this, I read this interesting quote and um, I want to get y'all's perspective on it. Cause it was, it's so Romans three twenty three. it says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And I read this quote and I was like, this is just so, it was so good and it's so humbling. And I feel like it kind of helped speak to, uh, you know, the idea of sometimes I think we can look at people around us and, you know, think we're more righteous because of other people's sins. And, yeah. you know, well, I'm better than so-and-so. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm better, which, which gets me in right standing with God, which cannot be further from the truth. But, I thought this quote was cool. It says, uh, the prostitute, the liar, and the murderer are short of it, but so are you. Perhaps they stand at the bottom of a mine and you on the crest of the Alps. But you are but you are as little able to touch the stars as they are. Mm. I was like, man, that is so Good. that's just so humbling of like we've all we've all fallen short. Even if you've done yeah. A million things versus if you've done a hundred things, you're, 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 you're still just as guilty. Um, but I thought just that, I don't know, just, just that visual was just cool to think about, thinking about the worst, the worst people that you can think about that are at the bottom of this valley. And then the best of the best that are, or however you want to phrase that, you know, on top of the mountain. And it's like, you know, you both can't touch the stars. You know, you're, 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 you're just as far as they are. And you know, going at it from Romans three twenty three that we've all we've all fallen short. I thought that was such a cool visual to to think about it and and to speak against that notion of you know because we all deal with it. I'm I'm guilty yeah. of it. It's easy to to you know to think well I'm I I haven't done as many things as as you know as 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 he or she, and you kind of can feel better about yourself. But uh, you know, in all actuality, we've all sinned. We've all broken the law. We're all short. We all need the same grace. We all need the same grace and we all need the same forgiveness. Um, I just think that verse is cool because I think it speaks, Paul speaks directly, you know, to people who are maybe more prideful or self-conceited or think that they are better than other people because they've done less bad things. And Paul's like, no, you've missed the point. Like you've all, like you've all fallen short. Like even the best of you, I've fallen short. Obviously Paul had a crazy past, but, you know, I think to speak into that notion of, um, you know, because it can, like I said, it can be easy to to look around and, and compare our sins to other people, and maybe we can feel better about ourselves because we've done less bad things. But it doesn't make you any any less guilty, right? Yeah, I really feel like our ultimate battle in this life is pride. Yeah, yep. I mean that's what we want to do. We point, you know, everything <laughs> we bring it to ourselves. And as similarly, uh, Philip Yancey broke a, wrote a book in the nineties, and he had that kind of a similar example. He said, "Imagine we're all standing on the field trying to jump to the moon." And like I'm bragging, it's like, bro, you can only jump six inches. I can jump two feet. It's like we're trying to get to the moon. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Just can do it. And and I've noticed in my life, pride manifests itself in two ways. One is I'm really proud of myself at how good I've done. Like, gosh, I read my Bible for a week. Like, God is in heaven. Just like, look at this cat, unbelievable. Man, yeah. I don't even need to help him out. He's got it. Mm-hmm. But I think pride <laughs> goes the other way. Whenever we beat ourselves up and we don't hit our you know, expectation of, oh, I forgot to read my Bible. I haven't prayed. I had a bad attitude. I had a slip up in something. Oh, that's it. God's mad at me. And in a way, that's still pride as well. Because mm-hmm. your righteousness is based in you yourself. Yeah. It's all in me. Good. So then I put that on God and I go, oh, God's so proud of me. 
when I do what I've decided as a good Christian. Man, I went to church this week and I read my Bible and I prayed. Oh man, God's impressed with me. And then whenever I don't meet my expectations, then um, I can feel God's real distant from me. It's like, it's all pride. It's my entire life and righteousness is based on Mm -hmm. me. What expectations I've given myself. I just love, this is like, man, none of you are righteous on your own. It is redemption through Jesus Christ. And for me and my faith, and I know all of us, the battle is to just get the focus off of myself and get it onto Jesus. And every day get up, Jesus, it is by your grace. It is by your blood. I live and I act and I share today. Fill me with you. And and we're on this battle, you know, and I think the more that we look to him as often the perfect of our faith and not for ourselves, yeah. we're getting on the right path. Right. The moment that you become your God and you decide every day how righteous you were and I was real mm-hmm. good and I was real bad, man, the focus, it don't matter what you did, the focus is off. Right. Mm-hmm. Save ourselves. Right. Yeah, I'm definitely on the latter side of that one. <laughs> Like, yeah, not, 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 not the pride from the standpoint of like thinking I'm better than other people, but the pride of like thinking I'm better when I do more things. That's right. Or when I, when I, I read four chapters today, I feel like God was more proud of me versus if I would have read one chapter, mm-hmm. you know, or I listened to worship music for an hour today instead of five minutes and God must be proud of me. So I, I, I do wrestle with that. Yeah. I mean, obviously, man, you know, there's so many things that we didn't get to whether it's you know more circumcision at the end or God's divine forbearance and passing over former sins um I think that's going to be the 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 great thing about Romans is that it's going to push us to you know to study things that maybe we're a little unfamiliar with and try to uh you know break it down for people who you know aren't super theological and haven't been to seminary but also you know love God and his word um but this also going to be the challenge of Man, there's some things that we, we aren't going to know and maybe we, we, we try to address it and maybe we kind of shy away from it. And not that we shied away from those things, but you know we're, uh, we're a little over time here, so we're going to wrap it up. But if you're listening, I just hope that that was encouraging to you and that it maybe challenged you for things that you've never thought about, whether it's um, yeah, fearing the Lord or having uh, you know, understanding the idea of grace and truly what Jesus did on the cross for you. Um, it can be easy to, to, to try to work towards our salvation, but... You know, we're, we're saved by faith and faith alone. Um, but at the same time, it is an active faith. So there are things that you have to, I don't maybe necessarily want to say do, but there are things in your life that show that you truly believe what you say you believe. So I just encourage you to be a doer of the word um, and not only a hearer, but I challenge you to to get in the word, to be disciplined with it and um, <clears throat> just to seek after God and to pursue. The Bible says, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. So Continue to seek, continue to knock, and um, God will open the door for whatever you are uh, looking to find. So appreciate y'all tuning in. Um, Join us next week as we dive into Romans 4 and talk about um, all the deep things of Romans 4 and talk about Abraham and, and how he was justified by his faith. So stay tuned for next week as we dive into Romans 4.